Good evening, everyone. It's good to see everybody back tonight. Get everyone to stand. We're going to sing Give Thanks. Yeah. If you were like me, you were giving thanks while that song was going on for many things we had to be thankful for. I thank God for the service we are in today and just for the chance to uh, just to, uh, just to get up and put clothes on and come back to church tonight as a blessing to be in the house of God. So thank you for being here with us tonight. 
Would you please bow your heads and hearts and go to the Lord and pray with me? Father, we just thank you for this service, God. Thank you for meeting with us once again, dear Father God. I just pray, dear God, that you just saturate this place with your presence, Father God, as we invite you, Father God, just to do in this place, dear Father God, what we cannot do, and that is touch and change lives. So, God, I just thank you for how you'll do that. God bless the students as they're meeting, dear Father God, and, and just pre in preparation for future events now, Lord God. God, I just thank you for your blessing upon this church and our families, dear God. We love you and thank you. In Christ's name I pray, believing. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Please be seated. Um, just a few things, not that many. We talked about these this morning, so I just want to remind you that um, after our service this evening, we'll have a finance meeting. We're actually going to meet in the fellowship hall, so if you're on the, fi on the um, finance team, uh, stewardship team, please meet in the, fin in the fellowship hall after our services tonight. And Wednesday, we'll have our business meeting uh, to go over um, all the financial reports. Uh, and the other thing is, I just want to make sure that everybody is well aware of the uh, funeral services for Mr. Richard Miner, who was Cindy Evans' dad. He went on to be the Lord Thursday evening about 6.08. And so he is uh, resting, and he I'm sure he's just, uh, he's as I share with the family, he's more alive than he's ever been. So just to see him struggle over these past few months, it is definitely a blessing and relief to know that he, uh, is, he's, in the, he's in the land uh, where, um, uh, where healing, uh, where, there's just, uh, where there's no more sickness, pain, or death. So thank God for that. Uh, so uh, the viewing for that, if you're interested in that, is going to be tomorrow night, Monday evening from 6 to 8 at Oxley Heard. And the service will be Tuesday morning, 11 a.m. at Celebration on Minor Road. And um, just, uh, just as a reminder, if you just want to help out with some food, uh, Celebration Baptist Church will be hosting the service and the, uh, the dinner. But they, uh, we are part, kind of partnering with them. So if you want to um, send some food, you, don't, you do not have to take it over there. But if you would have it here at the church by, say, around 10, 15, 10, 20, uh, Brother Farrell is going to load it all up and take it over there at 10, 30 on Tuesday. So uh, we appreciate your help and support with that. Would you please take the opportunity right now and stand and greet somebody in the name of Jesus.
we return to our seats, let's sing, Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, He met the need of my heart. Shadows and smelling with joy, I am telling, made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul born of the spirit with life from above into god's family divine justified fully through calvary's love oh what a standing is mine and the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner i came took the offer of grace he did proffer he saved me oh praise his dear name Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now I have a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time I have a future in heaven for sure there in those mansions sublime and it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe riches eternal and blessings eternal from his precious hand I receive heaven came down and glory filled my soul when at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to sing, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. And this will be your offertory hymn. Sweet. 
Father, we thank you for that sweet, sweet Holy Spirit that we experience when you're in our midst. And as we have gathered together in your name, we know that you are in our midst. Lord, we thank you that our hearts can offer uh, praise and honor and glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the many blessings that you bestow upon us. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful day that you've given us. Lord, we just... Uh, just pray, Father, that we always be mindful and, and thankful for all that you've given us through Jesus Christ and his shed blood. Father, we think of the uh, many uh, physical, material blessings, and, and we know that every good and perfect gift comes from above. But, Father, even those tangible blessings, as good as they are, don't compare to those spiritual blessings that we have. We thank you, Father, for the assurance that we have of eternal life. We thank you, Father, for the grace that you've given us. We thank you for forgiveness and mercy. Lord, we thank you for your love that was manifest on Calvary's cross when Christ shed his blood for the remission of our sins. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for, Lord, that uh, might we just pause occasionally and, and just give thanks for those many blessings. Lord, now as we come to this portion of this worship service, we ask that these tithes and offerings would be used in such a way that would magnify the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, your, your son. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hey, how you doing? Be good? Good, Tony, before you get in trouble. I uh, know. Paul met the Lord on Damascus Road. He never was the same again. When Peter met the Lord, he left his boat and started fishing for men. I may not be Peter or Paul, of what the disciples said. Oh I, my gosh, mm -hmm. I forgot the word. He made a change. He made a change in the way that I'm walking. He made a change, made a change in the life that I'm walking. Old things pass away. Behold, everything's new. We made a change in the life that I'm living. I'm born again, set free, finally forgiven. 
He can make a change in me. He can make a change in you. Saw some old friends shaking their head because they never thought to see the day when a sinner like me would praise the Lord or bow my head to pray. I may not be what I used to be, for my life's been rearranged. Nothing that I've done, but i found someone who's definitely made a change. Made a change. He made a change in the way that I'm talking. Old days pass away. Behold, everything's new. He made a, made a change in the life that I'm living. I'm born again, set free, finally forgiven. He can make a change in me. He can make a change in you. Made a change. He made a change. Old things pass away. Behold, everything's new. He made a change, he made a change, he can make a change in me, he can make a change in you. He made a change, he made a change, old things pass away, behold everything's new, I say. He made a change, change in the life that I'm given. I'm born again, set free, finally forgiven. He can make a change in me. He can make a change in you. He can make a change in me. He can make a change in you. He can make a change in me. He can make a change in you. He made a change. Amen. Well, brother, we got the bus out there. You about ready to go on tour, it sounds like. Man, that's good stuff. As a blessing, amen. Please take a copy of God's Word and find the third chapter of Ephesians in your New Testament. Ephesians chapter number 3 this evening. Ephesians chapter 3. I want to speak to you tonight for a few moments on this subject. God is closer than He appears. God is closer than He appears. Ephesians chapter number 3. And once you find your place in the Scripture, if you can physically stand, please stand with me tonight in honor and reverence for the reading of the Word of God. We began a series a few weeks ago on the, um, on the topic of Jesus continued, on how that the Spirit inside us is, is better than the Jesus beside us. So tonight we're continuing that, that series. Tonight, part two, God is closer than He appears. In Ephesians chapter 3, I'll begin reading in verse number 16, that he, would grant, uh, that he would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Father God, thank you so very much for how you've already blessed the service, God, this, uh, this evening, dear Father God. I just thank you. You just for giving us a teachable spirit. And God, I pray you just pour your truth into our lives. God, I pray that every heart will be open and receptive to what you have to say to us through your word. Lord, we pray this believing because we ask it in Jesus' name. And if you can agree with that prayer, help me say amen. Amen. Please be seated. So a few statements I want to make by way of introduction, and that is this. God is everywhere, God is with us, and God is always listening. Okay? God is everywhere, God is with us, and God is always listening. Now, we believe these statements to be true, but often we do not feel the force of their truth. Is that accurate to say? Do you always uh, feel that God is with you, and do you always feel confident that God is listening? Now, we know that God is close to us, so why... 
You know, why at times does he seem so far away? We know that he promises to be with us, and yet there are many times that we do not sense his presence. Perhaps there's many reasons for this, but tonight we're going to take a deeper look at the presence of God as a fundamental promise of the gospel. So here's a good question. Do we, do we even know what the presence of God is like? That's a good question. Do I know, do I even know, can I wrap my mind around what is the presence of God like? Is it, is it only during the worship service when you get that tingly feeling whenever the music crescendos at just the right time? You know, maybe there are people who are just looking for the presence of God only in grand and obvious ways, like when there's miraculous healings or, or just uh, uh, even um, in other circles where there's fainting spells that take place. Is that what the presence of God looks like? Friends, I want you to see and understand uh, tonight we take a deeper look into this, into the text and to the fundamental truths of the gospel that the presence of Jesus manifested in the Holy Spirit of God is present in, ever, in our everyday lives. So the text says there that he would grant you. Now Paul, he is actually praying this prayer for the Ephesian believers. So he says there that he would grant you according to the riches of the glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. So if Paul is praying for Christians who by definition already have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, why is he praying for Christ and the Spirit to dwell in their hearts? If they were already were Christians and who a Christian by definition already has Christ and the Holy Spirit of God, already living and abiding in our hearts, why was he praying then that they would be filled and strengthened in the inner man with Jesus? John Stott writing these words. He said, what Paul asked for is for his readers that they may be fortified, braced, and invigorated, that they may know the strength of the Spirit's inner reinforcement and may hold ever more firmly by faith of this divine calling. Uh, so that, notice it says that, notice the text, it says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by what? By faith. It, it does not say feelings. You know, listen, we need to understand as a, as a child of God that we're saved not based on our feelings, but we're saved based on faith. And so we are strengthened. He says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, being rooted and grounded in love. So listen, God is so much more than just an emotional feeling that comes and goes. But listen, God is an ever-present reality in every born-again believer. You agree with that? Because it's so easy to get caught up in the emotion, coming to church and getting the, 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 uh, the, the emotional aspect, you're feeling good, and we can leave church saying, well, I, I felt good because you know, I went to church. You, you remember back in the day, you know, I remember this as a young Christian, you go to Sunday school, and, and the, first thing you, well, you first, the first thing you used to get was a donut and juice, and that'll bless you, amen. The second thing was the envelope. And the, on the envelope it said, brought my Bible, invited somebody, uh, uh, giving today, and you would check off the box. And so, and so basically what, 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 uh, what that would drive into your mind is, it kind of gave you the mindset of just going through the motions and checking off the box of Christianity. And while that is good for record keeping and tracking purposes, it kind of instills, uh, 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 instills a robotic type service in us when we're just we're just we're, when we don't have an intimate relationship with Jesus, and we just look forward to checking off the boxes on Sunday. Well, let me read my Bible so I can check it off on Sunday. Well, let me give you a few dollars so I can check it off the envelope and make myself look good. You know what? I better I better uh, invite somebody to church so I can check it off the box. Listen, Christianity is more than just an emotion. Listen, the presence of God was never meant just to be an emotion that is contained inside the church walls. The presence of God goes with us everywhere we go. And as I've always said, that God never goes anywhere because he's already there. The presence of God fills the whole world, and thank God that he is always, he's always with us. Now notice what the basis is for strengthening our faith. If you ever wondered, what are, what are some of the foundations of strengthening our faith? Well, it's found in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And by the way, uh, we are grateful. I've got to make one more point about this before we move on. We're grateful to know that our relationship with Jesus, our salvation experience, is based on faith and not feelings. Because, see, our feelings, do our feelings change? 
How about, I don't know about you, but listen, our feelings can constantly change. So if our faith, if our salvation experience was incumbent and based upon our feelings, we'd be saved one day, lost the next, saved for three more days, lost for 17 more days. But listen, when we, uh, when we place our faith and trust in Jesus, our faith is based on the Word of God. Feelings may change, but the Word of God never changes. So when we, when we express and, uh, genuine faith in, in Jesus Christ. We experience genuine salvation that is based upon something that is fixed and forever, and that is the Word of God. So notice what the basis is for strengthening our faith. It says in verse 17 that you being rooted and grounded in love. So the first part of verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love. So that, that is the, the basis, that is the foundation for strength in our faith. Faith is, be, is to be rooted and grounded in love. L- let me just share with you some poor substitutes uh, that, 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 is, that, that is very easy for a uh, young or immature Christian to look to, to energize and kind of to jumpstart their faith. We were all there. If you can remember back, you know, may, maybe for some of us it was only a few years ago. Maybe for some of us we really got to look back in a few decades but remember when you first come to faith in Jesus Christ, what were some of the things that you looked to to energize your faith? And I'm trying to get traction here because it's so easy to, uh, to, ha- to, to form a poor substitute for maturing our faith. I'll give you three of them, okay? I'll just come up these off the top of my head. Three substitutes that are a poor substitute for strengthening our faith. And that is what I'm going to call a flamboyant pastor. Okay, a flamboyant pastor. It can be so easy to get caught up in the in the in the in the preacher's style and get so attracted to following a preacher. But listen, the Bible teaches us that if you really want to strengthen strengthen your faith, it has nothing to do with the man, but has everything to do with God and the Word of God. So listen, in regardless of how well he speaks or how eloquent you know words and theology in the Hebrew and Greek can roll off his tongue. Listen, our faith is not rooted and grounded in a man or a sermon, but it's rooted and grounded in the Word of God. So that can be a poor substitute for a a young Christian who's trying to mature and energize their faith. Number two is is flamboyant praise. You know, it's easy to get caught up in the latest and greatest. We want what's flowing and going, you know. But listen, there again, we're being stylistic when we choose certain things like worship and music and the style because why our faith is not rooted and grounded in music. Our faith, if it's really going to be strengthened at the end of the day, it must stand upon the Word of God. So there's flamboyant pastor, flamboyant praise. And, and the third thing I called false protein. False protein. First Peter 2, 2 says these words, As newborn babes desire the, the sincere, pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. How many of you know, mamas, you know this, but uh, uh, most of us know that as long as long as mama is feeding little Junior, he's going to get good quality milk. Is that right? Yeah, that's right for the most part. But if you put Junior down on the floor, what's he going to eat? He's going to put anything that's at his level. Is that right? Listen, a young Christian, this is why it's important that we get them in Sunday school, that we get them in church, that we get them plugged in somewhere, because just as a little, uh, as a little infant, will eat anything he can get his hands on, so will an immature Christian. They will eat any kind of doctrine they get their hands on, and sometimes uh, they can get their hands on some, a perverted gospel out there that will lead them out in, uh, at left field somewhere, so it is important to know that we get good protein and good milk, the good milk of the Word, in a young Christian's hands. So, um, Karl Barth, the renowned theologian, was, was once asked to summarize his, tho- his whole theology in one sentence. You know, what would you say? If you was put on the spot, asked to, hey, give me, a one, give me one sentence that would summarize your whole Christian experience. What would you come up with? Here's what he said. The, great the-, the renowned theologian said this. In response to the question or, or to the statement to, uh, he was asked to summarize his whole, the- his whole theology in one sentence, he replied, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Profound truth expressed in simple words, but unfortunately sometimes we get so familiar 
just with the statement of God's love that we actually miss the bigger picture of how God chose to express his love. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Listen, our Bible teaches us that God demonstrated his love in, sin, in sending his son to die for us. Would anybody in the sanctuary tonight argue that point? God demonstrated his love by sending his son Jesus to die for us. But here's, an, here's another important question to ask. Why did Jesus, or excuse me, why did God send his son to die? Why did God send his son to die? Well, the short answer is this, and that is to, to reconcile us. To reconcile us. The more, the, the more practical answer is because God wanted to be with us. God wanted to be with us. So he washed away our sin so he, uh, so, uh, so he could welcome us into his presence. So listen, we need to understand that God wants to be with us. Too many Christians get the first part right, and, and we get the first part of the truth correct that God loves us, and even the second part that Jesus became our sacrifice. But then we miss the purpose. He did all of that in order that we may be his people, in order that we may have a born-again experience, and that we might be part of the family of God. So what, are, what is the result of such a fallacy? The result is this, that we actually think that God loves us, but he don't really like us that much to want to hang around us that much. Does, ever, does, does anybody, and, and please don't raise your hands, do you have any family members if you think about the family reunions that you got planned and the Thanksgiving gatherings and Christmas, you love family, but there's some you just choose not to hang around as much. Um, don't raise your hand, but I'm here uh, Monday through Thursday. We can, we can talk and pray about this, though, okay? So come see me. All right. So many people have this, this sort of picture of God, that God is just an abstract God that is not very fond of us personally. Friends, listen, I want to correct that tonight if that, if that's, if, if that is misconstru misconstrued in your mind. Listen, God, our God is not a God of the abstract. Our God is a God who loves us up close and personal. Amen? I mean, he loves us up close and personal. Listen to Jeremiah 23, 23. God says, am I God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God far off? God said he wanted, to, he, he wanted the Hebrews to know I'm not uh, like the pagan gods out there who are just uh, who, are, who don't have a personal relationship with their people. But God said, "I'm a, uh, I'm an up close and personal God." You know, we was mentioning and, and talking in Sunday school this morning. And if you're in Sunday school, every single of you, every single one of you saw the scripture today. We talked about Joshua when God really was dealing with his heart to bring a powerful message to the people of Israel. To, to, uh, to remove their hands, to let go of the pagan gods of Egypt. And, you know, I didn't really touch on this in, our, in our, series, our sermon series on the Ten Plagues on Sunday morning, but just to put it into perspective how much of an influence the, the pagan deities in Egypt had on the Israelites, remember when God led them out of Egypt to the Promised Land, when Moses uh, told them to wait at the base of the mountain while he went up there for 40 days to get the Ten Commandments, and because they just got impatient and just was, were ready to give up on the man of God, they came to Aaron and said, we want you to build us a what? A golden calf. If you remember, if you remember plague number five of the diseased cattle, the, 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 uh, the people in Egypt would worship a false deity that they thought was in the, uh, uh, was in the uh, form and fashion of a bull. So see the Hebrews resorting back to their old pagan ways they had learned in Egypt, so God was separating them. And he wants them to know, and he wants you, sir. Ma'am, he wants you to know tonight that he is not just a God that is afar off. Although feelings in, in your emotions, you may feel that God is. But understand this, feelings are a good, uh, they're a good indicator, but they're a poor dictator. Because listen, God wants you to know that he's not just a, a, an abstract, off-the-distance God who, who only shows up. You know, when you throw the, throw the light up, throw the cross up, like a Batman symbol, he comes to rescue you. That is not the kind of God that we serve. We serve a God that is ever-present with us every single moment of our lives. So the Holy Spirit's work is ongoing. Luke 3, verse 21 and 22 is Luke's description of when he saw Jesus, when he attended Jesus' baptism. Notice 
the way he describes that moment. He said, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Has anybody else been baptized in here besides me? Raise your hand if you've been baptized. Most of us have been baptized. Now, when you were baptized, did the Holy Spirit of God descend upon you like a dove? I was hoping y'all would say that, because if you said yes, once again, my office is open and we can do some <laughs> counseling and prayer. But listen, I don't think many of us you know, have had, uh, had the similar experience that Jesus had, that at his baptism, the Holy Spirit would just, uh, just visually, just visibly descend and, and come upon him. But I can tell you this, I can tell you this with all accuracy, you know, the Holy Spirit of God didn't come, uh, just didn't descend on me at my baptism, but the day I got saved, oh yeah, I didn't see it. Nobody else saw it, but I promise you the Holy Spirit of God came into me, and he has never, ever left me. And so notice what, uh, notice what Luke says concerning this. And then the Holy Spirit descended in the body form, form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven and said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit's work, the Holy Spirit's job is ongoing. His Listen, when we first were saved, if you can remember that moment, so I've kind of kind of touched on that when uh, a few moments ago that will kind of bring you back to your salvation experience. If you can remember that moment uh, just prior to your conversion, was not the Holy Spirit of God at work in your life convicting you of sin? Was He not showing you that you are a sinner in need of a Savior and that if you did not put your trust in Jesus that you would bust hell wide open? And was it not because of His conviction and because of Him drawing you uh, uh, was it not because of his work that you became a child of the king? Well, listen, once you got saved and you trusted Jesus, did the Holy Spirit of God just fold up operation and leave you? Oh, no. No, he's, listen, he's not the heavenly headhunter. You know how the headhunters for employees go looking for other people to bring them on? And once they get hired on, they go looking for the next person. The Holy Spirit of God is not a heavenly headhunter that once you get saved, he's just going to leave you and go look for the next person to get saved. He will be with you forever. So the presence of God is not just an emotional feel we get at church. It is ongoing. And so uh, so, some takeaways, you know, from uh, Jesus' baptism that I want you to see. Because we kind of get the we kind of get the feeling that if we do enough good things, that Jesus will love me. We look for affirmation in, 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 in when we do good actions that Jesus will love us. But can I tell you that if Jesus' baptism was a model, and I believe it is, it shows us that that, that, that the Spirit of God descended upon Jesus, and Luke and all the gospel writers heard a voice from heaven. They knew it was God, and the voice said these words. This is my beloved son in, in whom I am well, what? Pleased. When did his baptism take place? Did it take place just before he was crucified? Oh, no. Listen, it happened at the beginning of his ministry before he healed anybody, before he walked on water, before he ever cast out a demon. Listen, before he did anything, before he stretched the, the bread and fish and, and feed the multitude, before he performed anything, God Almighty had already said, I am well pleased in my son. And listen, because of Jesus, because of his punishment, we share in the position of Jesus Christ. And that tells me that I don't have to perform in order to get God to love me. Listen, I don't have to preach a good sermon in order to get God to love me. I don't have to lead 10 people to Jesus this week or God's going to love me any less. He loves me just like I am. So listen, we don't have to continue to strive and to work and try to get affirmation to know that God loves me. Understand this, before you did anything, before you woke up today, Jesus loves you. Verse 19, notice the wording, and to know the love of Christ. You know the word know there is, a, is, is, is a, it, it, this is a love that's based upon experience. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. It even goes beyond, it even goes beyond knowledge. You know the word know there, it's a word that speaks of intimacy. 
If you go back to the Old Testament, the Bible says that Adam, that he knew his wife. It speaks of the intimacy that he had. Listen, God wants to have an up-close and and an intimate. He wants to have a personal relationship with each of us. And the Scripture says, and to know the love of Christ. You know, we we, we shouldn't have to guess at the end of the day, does God love me? No, we shouldn't have to wonder, am I a Christian? We shouldn't have to wonder, you know, uh, uh, where will I spend eternity? The Word of God, the authoritative Word of God shows us, and I hope this is really speaking deep into your life tonight, that, that, that God wants to have a personal relationship with each one of us. So we talk about being saved. We use the word saved, being saved. We use the lingo we're used to the, the verbiage there. And what we're referring to is how we're saved by God from sin. But where, the Bible, but, but where we stop, the Bible keeps going. Because how many of you know that not only are we saved from sin, we are saved for something as well. Yes, we're saved from sin, but God has saved us for something. What has He saved us for? He has saved us to have a relationship with us so that we might know Him and so that we might love Him. If you want to write this scripture down, you can. It's Jeremiah 31, verses 33 and 34. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. And notice this. And he says, For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Oh, I love the fact, friends, that God, listen, listen, God is not just an old senile God that just forgets our sin. He chooses to remember our sins no more. I was talking to Brother Kirby Hendricks just the other day. I said, how are things going with you and Miss Janice? He said, well, we had a heated conversation the other day. It kind of is almost getting out of hand. I said, what happened, Brother Kirby? He said, well, she, she, got all, she got historical on me. I said, Brother Kirby, don't you mean she got hysterical? He said, oh, no, she got historical. She started telling me everything I've ever done wrong. <laughs> Friends, aren't you glad? You know what? If God wanted to, he could get historical on us. If God wanted to, he could start naming them off one by one, all the things that we have done that, broken, that have broken his heart. But aren't you glad to know tonight that God chooses not to remember our sins no more? And for, listen, it's not the idea, it is not the idea that God is just going to kind of come at, at the point of salvation and fix and mend our hearts according to what God said to Jeremiah and through Jeremiah for the house of Israel, that God was not just going to fix their broken hearts, God's going to give them a brand new heart. He's not talking about just heart, um, uh, just, um, uh, just heart rehab. He's talking about a brand new heart. So we, as Christians, if you've experienced Jesus, not only, listen, he has not just uh, fixed your heart, he's given us a brand new heart. We've had a heart transplant because that is what Jesus does. So if you remember from this morning's message, Paul gave the analogy on bearing fruit, and I, I want to tie it in to this message tonight. I'll read it once again. This is Paul's analogy that he gave to the uh, the church at Galatia in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. So fruit is the natural reaction of being alive on the branch. Uh, try Try to visualize that. Imagine that. Fruit, it is the natural reaction of being alive on the branch. When the Spirit of God is alive in us, His fruit will naturally grow in our hearts. When the Spirit of God, listen, when we, as verse 19, and to know the love of Christ, when we are where we belong in a correct relationship with Jesus, and we are knowing Him by experience, meaning we we have gone beyond just coming to church, but we're reading our Bible daily, we're praying to God, and we're leaning in because we have a personal relationship with God. When the Spirit of God is alive in our hearts, guess what things will grow naturally out of our lives? Love, 
joy, peace, kindness, long-suffering, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But it's only when we are abiding in the vine. And listen, uh, uh, listen, an unhealthy branch does not bear anything. But when we're healthy, when we're healthy as a believer, we will bear fruit for the glory of God. And so let me just uh, uh, use this illustration, a few more words, and and we'll be done tonight. Just as a married couple, if you can imagine uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 um, the process of physical fruit of producing a child. So in the moments of conception, they are not thinking of the mechanics of making a child. They're just swept up in love for one another, and the fruit is the child. And so similarly, when we get swept up, in an intimate interaction, in a relationship with Jesus Christ, the gospel, the fruit that will be produced in our lives, is love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Listen, when we are loving Jesus, we don't have to focus on man, I got to wake up tomorrow and I got to produce some love. I tell you what, man, I tell you what, I got to wake up tomorrow, I got to produce some joy. I got to get up tomorrow and I'm going to strive to produce some peace. And if it kills me, I'm going to be kind to somebody tomorrow. And man, I tell you what, I'm going to be so good. And, and I, I tell you what, I'm going to be patient. I'm going to have long suffering. If it kills me, I'm going to be patient. I got to hurry up and get some patience. Listen, when it comes to producing fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, it will naturally grow out of our lives. We don't have to focus on each, every one of them, but if we're abiding in Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit, it will naturally manifest itself and it will grow in our lives. So water your life with the Word of God. There must be some pruning. You've got to clean the weeds out so that there is, so that there is a good gospel presentation because uh, as, as I shared with the class in Sunday school this morning, we're talking about how important it is to live the Christian life. How important is it to demonstrate to a lost world what we say we believe is everything? Listen, you can go, you can go around, and have, you can be the best vocal witness in the church. You can, you can go around and just invite all of you to church. Listen, but if you don't have a visible witness to back up your vocal witness, nobody is going to care what you're saying. If they hear you saying one thing, but they see you living another way, they will disregard your word as worthless. So listen, we as Christians, we don't, listen, we, enough of us, and I, I've been guilty of this before, we don't need to be an alibi for the hypocrites staying home. We, we need to be genuine light that shines so that we can give ourselves a platform. Listen, when we live in right, we'll give ourselves a platform so we can share the Word of God so that it will be received. They say, this, they say that spirituality is just like biology. You ever heard this before? Spirituality is just like biology because if it's not growing, it's dead. If it's not growing, it's dead. If your faith is not growing, it's either stagnant, your faith is in remission, or it's just plumb dead. Friends, uh, uh, you're here tonight, and I pray that Jesus Christ of Nazareth will just speak into your life. And if there is just a, uh, if there's just a few uh, a pulse of faith in your life, may He renew you and revigorate you tonight, so that you just don't have just a half-hearted faith, but you're full on leaning in, wanting to become more like Jesus, less of me and more of him. So water your life, let Jesus clean the weeds out of our life, prune back the areas in our lives so that, there, so that the Spirit of God is alive in us and we're in a perfect relationship with Jesus so we can produce the fruit of the Spirit. Has, anyone, has anybody ever seen an apple tree eat its own apples? That's weird, right? <laughs> Once again, if you've seen that, my office is, I'm just kidding. A tree produces fruit, not for itself, but for others. Is that right? So listen, when the Word of God admonishes us to abide in Christ, to to be that branch that is plugged in faithfully, consistently to the vine, and we get back to Galatians 5, 
Paul in his monologue about the fruit of the Spirit, we are to bear the fruit of the Spirit, not for our sakes, not just for our benefit, not to build up our spiritual resume in heaven so we can stand before God and say, God, what not? Just a beautiful tree down there for you. Oh, God, you've seen all my fruit that I blossomed, right? No. We are to produce fruit for the glory of God, but also for the benefit of others so that they may see us and so that we would be a sweet savor of life unto life, as Jude says, so that we can win others to faith in Jesus. Would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you for this evening. God, thank you for your word. And God, I just praise you so very much for uh, just uh, as we draw near to this, uh, uh, this time uh, uh, where we can respond. And God, I pray that if there's a heart that you're dealing with tonight, Father God, if there is one here tonight who is, uh, um, uh, whom, uh, whom faith has been an afterthought in their life. God, I pray that tonight it would be on the, on the front burner of their, uh, of, their, uh, uh, of their strategy. And so, Lord God, I just pray to tonight, Lord God, that, there's, that if there's one here tonight that is struggling in growing their faith, that there's, no, that there's not been anything producing in their lives, God, show them, dear Father God, bring to the surface of their lives the things that are holding them back and hindering them, dear God, May there be repentance. May there be a confession tonight. And God, I just thank you so very much for how you'll bless. I pray this believing, Lord God, because I ask it in Jesus' name. Would you please stand with me tonight? Please stand with me. The invitation is given for you, sir, ma'am. The invitation is for myself. You, you think I'm just preaching, I'm preaching out to the east because this is the east. Hey, this message comes back to the west a lot of times and comes back to this preacher right here. So listen. Uh, uh, I, never, I never want to preach a message uh, anywhere that I can't preach everywhere. And this message also hits me right here as well. So listen, if you are here tonight and faith is just, uh, 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 just nothing that's real, listen, God is closer than you think He is. He is prayer away. And if you're here tonight and you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, He is also just a prayer away. Listen, he's not thousands of miles up in, the, uh, up in the sky. He's just a prayer away. The prayer of faith. A prayer of faith. And Jesus can step out of heaven and step into your heart. Would you please once again just bow your head and close your eyes? And I would be, I would be remiss to leave here tonight without giving an opportunity for, for, uh, for a person to trust Jesus. So, sir, ma'am, if that is you, in the event that you're here tonight and you never have responded to a gospel invitation to be saved, I pray tonight that, that tonight you would respond and say yes to Jesus. Say yes to the cross. Say yes to His shed blood. Say yes to His atonement and His covering. And don't leave this world without Him. Do not leave this world without Him. Friends, if you have never prayed to invite Christ into your heart, I want to lead you in this prayer, but make this your own. Make this your prayer. Are you ready? Heavenly Father, I admit that I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. I want to be saved. Only you, Jesus, can save me. Tonight, I receive you as my Savior and as my Lord. With your help and with your strength, I will live for you for the rest of my life. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. As we sing... If you're saying, would you come? Uh, if there's a, a decision that needs to be made, would you do it tonight? As we sing, would you come? Jesus, keep me near.
thank you for your kind attention this morning and tonight. Great to have you back here this evening. And as we can finish this Lord's Day with our, our final benediction song, I pray that we would uh, just take advantage of every opportunity that God gives us this week to, to be that visible and that vocal witness to uh, just to spread His love. Listen, your, your mission field is different than mine, and you're going to walk in places this week that I will not walk. I will walk in places this week that you will not walk. The important thing is that we are going about our Father's business, so, we, so may we be busy this week for our Father. Amen? You agree with that? May we be busy this week for our Father, and Lord willing, I'll see you soon. Um, there's something else on my mind, but us or, oh, here it is. It came back. Here it is. Here it is. Please, in your prayer time, be, uh, be in prayer for um, First Baptist. For Nadine, I just found out today that uh, many of you know Jeff Overton. I know Brother Michael knows Brother Jeff Overton. His heart's probably he- a little heavy tonight. Jeff is, um, uh, has been called to another church uh, in um, um, Douglas, Georgia. Douglas, Georgia. So if you keep First, uh, First Baptist in your prayers, as, and Jeff, as his family goes through this transition, pray for that faith family as well. All right. Reach out to your neighbor and we'll have our song of dismissal tonight. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He is worthy to be praised and adored. So we lift up holy hands in one accord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is worthy to be praised and adored. So we lift up holy hands in one accord, singing blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord.